latest installment of uh, Frank and Mary here in Ashland, the COVID-19 COVID edition. If you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. My day job, I do elder law at a firm called Myrick O'Connell, but this is not about law. This is about my friends Frank and Mary, who many of you have met before. If you've been to presentations of my senior, the Senior Center, Frank and Mary, their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., they want to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And right now, they just want to get out of their house because they've been stuck in the house forever, right? And so um, you've seen the show. And so Steve, my, my good friend and, and selectman Steve Mitchell um, has been um, my co-host because he finds these great guests interview. And I find myself just being here doing comic relief. But Steve continues to do this. Uh, he, we've had this guest before, but he's, this is a person who's got information that is ever new. Steve, whom do we have here today? Well, first of all, Arthur, always a pleasure doing the show with you. And I think we're like a year and a half into this project, and it's 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 been a lot of fun. We've had some great guests. Uh, today, we have a special guest, and, and that is our state rep, Jack Lewis, uh, who represents the town of Ashland and part of the town of Framingham. And, uh, you know, Jack is passionate about, uh, you know, a lot of topics and, and topics that are really consistent with with the purpose of our show. So, Jack, uh, welcome aboard, and uh, good to see you. Good to see you both as well, and thank you for the invitation to return to the show. Very good. So, you know, Art, I thought we would uh, just kind of freeform a conversation today about, uh, you know, COVID-19 and its impact on certainly our senior demographic but you know, I, I think it, it will probably expand into an area where we recognize that this pandemic has really impacted people differently and unfairly and equitably in many, many ways. And the challenges that, that vulnerable populations have, whether it's with food security, with rental relief or, and so on. And I know Jack is passionate about that stuff and I think can be very articulate and eloquent about that. So. Uh, so, Jack, why don't you just kind of give us a, an update of what's going on at the State House and, and you know, some, some the, the kind of big picture things, and then uh, I think talk about your particular issues of concern uh, at the local level. Perfect. And uh, thanks for raising expectations high there uh, that I'm going to be with, <laughs> articulate. Uh, and I forget what the other word was. Well, thank uh, you also for lowering the average age of this group here. So <laughs> this is, uh, that's why we, but this is actually our affirmative action uh, program representative. We're, uh, this is, we pointed out with somebody under, under, under 65. So we really appreciate your <laughs> I'm Always happy to, uh, to help you out with uh, the demographics. Uh, but uh, just like folks uh, at home, all of you, uh, state reps, state senators, we've been trying to figure out how to do our jobs in this world that none of us imagined uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, and so what that means is everything from legislating to helping people with constituent affairs uh, to participating in meetings, all of that is, is different. Uh, and with a majority of my work before COVID-19 being on helping constituents uh, be connected to state services, uh, that has only continued uh, and expanded as more and more people have needed uh, supports from the states or from the local government or from the feds. But the legislation, the legislative process hasn't ended. Uh, it hasn't actually slowed down too much at all. Uh, it just has entered this, this new era of folks working remotely while also trying to make sure that the economy still moves forward, uh, that the democratic process uh, isn't ignored because of this time of crisis. Uh, but what we've also found is all of us, and I know Steve at the local level, you found this as well, the, the lanes we tried to stay in in our work before uh, aren't necessarily what the community needs today because people are looking to us for guidance and for advice. Uh, and while I might sit on the public health committee, uh, while I might care a great deal about issues relating to children and families, I, I, I'm not a doctor and I don't pretend to be a, a public health expert, uh, but people are still looking to us for guidance on how to keep their families safe. Uh, 
advice to give uh, their parents who are in uh, maybe assisted living facilities. And so more and more of our work actually has become how to connect people, not just to state services, but with factually accurate information. Uh, we all know that in this, in this day, you can go online and find a hundred different answers uh, to one question. And the great majority of those answers might be unfortunately based in conspiracy theories or unvalidated or uh, unverified information. And so trying to help people uh, make sense of that isn't necessarily something that uh, you or I ever imagined as part of our, our, our responsibility as elected officials. Uh, but now more than ever, helping to get information out to folks. Uh, we can no longer rely on me starting my week at the Senior Center in Ashland at lunch and knowing that if I had something I needed to get out to folks, I had a, a, a captive audience of 30 to 50 people every Monday uh, or the first Thursday of the month with the, uh, the breakfasts. Uh, we don't have that. We don't even have the opportunity to put things on bulletin boards anymore. Uh, so we've been investing money into targeted social media ads in multiple languages. Uh, I've been doing something that historically I've decided not to do for various reasons, but engaging people in uh, Facebook uh, groups, trying to clarify misinformation and making sure my, my, my contact information is out there. Um, so that is probably a not so brief overview of the work we're doing. Uh, your state government, just as your, your, your local government, is still working for you. Uh, we're probably all putting in more hours than before. Uh, I don't have the big hour or two lost each way going into Boston. Uh, I roll out of bed, start doing emails, and uh, I take the computer to bed with me often and fall asleep responding to emails. Uh, somewhere in there, I part-time parent a little. Uh, but just like most of you, I'm, I'm hunkered down uh, in my home the great majority of the time, uh, trying to model the best and healthiest behavior. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I'm happy for this opportunity. Uh, and one of my hopes is that as this conversation is aired online and on uh, WACA, uh, that more folks will uh, reach out to my office to Senate President Karen Spilka's office, uh, or even to you, Steve, we'll, we'll forward the, the questions right to you. Well, Jack, I, I appreciate that. I think, you know, we do get uh, certainly a lot of questions, and I, I think you raise a good point with all of the uh, noise that's out there right now. And some of it is, is accurate, much of it is not. So how do people really uh, maneuver through this, this haze of, of commentary, opinion, uh, and you know, scams have always been part of uh, the concerns with the senior demographic. But even more so today, it seems like the scam artists are just coming out of the woodwork, unfortunately. But you know, I think we want to focus on you know th th those kinds of uh, um, initiatives and concerns that you have as as a state rep. I mean, I think you you came to office, you know, with a with a certain uh, a mindset and a certain uh, um, commitment to you know social issues and so on, and that's what we're what we're about on this show as well. Whether again, it's and we you know Jack was on our uh, at our select boards meeting uh, this past Wednesday, and I think you spoke to a number of those those issues uh, pretty well. So you know if you want to touch on some of those, we talked about few food insecurities and you know, the concerns with rent and, and, and local business and so on. Uh, happy, happy to do that. Uh, as you said, the folks that were most vulnerable before this pandemic are now in even greater need. Uh, but the reality is that there are folks who have never been to a food pantry except to make a donation who are now dependent on the food at the food pantry. Uh, mm -hmm people who have long paid into the social safety net, uh, paid into unemployment benefits, uh, paid into state taxes, and maybe not always felt that they were getting back what they, uh, their rate of return wasn't uh, for them personally, uh, what they wanted it to be. 
Uh, but now people who have never been on unemployment are now trying to manage or manage a, a complicated application process, uh, one that uh, isn't always clear, uh, that requires a little bit of tech savvy um, uh, understanding. Uh, but what we're finding is the vulnerable population before COVID is now much more vulnerable. Uh, and we now have an expanded group of folks who are not, they're one paycheck away from not being able to pay rent. Uh, they're one paycheck away from not being able to feed their families. Uh, and as you just said, on top of all of that, uh, the scams are not uh, going away. Uh, and unlike most weeks where they can go to the senior center or town hall and casually just ask you or ask me, I, I, it's happened multiple times. Jack, I got this letter in the mail. It looks legit from the, the IRS. Uh, can you help me out? And you know, we make a phone call and see if it's legit. We're not having those, those casual conversations uh, to help people out. But the other thing, so uh, food insecurity, uh, making sure folks uh, aren't being evicted if they can't pay their rent. Uh, the tension there being what it means for folks who are landlords and their, um, their quality of life, their ability to feed their families is contingent on others being able to pay their rent. Uh, we, I could talk at length about uh, immigrants in our community, and not just uh, undocumented immigrants, but also immigrants who are married to uh, U.S. citizens, uh, maybe immigrants who have a green card, uh, are married to a U.S. citizen, who for whatever reason were not made eligible uh, for the, um, the, the financial incentive, the, the check sent out by the feds, where my family received a check in the mail uh, based on my income and how many kids we had. Uh, because my spouse is a U.S. citizen, we were eligible. Uh, but if my neighbor had a, the same exact income uh, and had the same number of kids, uh, but their spouse were had a green card and wasn't yet a U.S. citizen, they were out those thousands of dollars um, in, in that financial incentive. Uh, the other piece, and this is probably more gets to the, the major themes of your show, uh, seniors with COVID-19 are, if not the most, among the top two or three most vulnerable populations. Uh, many folks are contracting COVID-19. There are cases of young people uh, having serious reactions and even dying. But the, the, the studies show us that the older you are, uh, the more likely you are to have a severe reaction uh, and to pass away. Uh, and even people in their 30s might have pre-existing health conditions, but as, as you know, as you get older, you, you develop often a couple more pre-existing health conditions that, that come along with age and extended life. Uh, and how to make sure that seniors and those who have pre-existing conditions are protected as states begin to uh, rush towards reopen the economy. And that's actually what I'm spending a lot of energy now doing with my colleagues is urging the governor to be even more intentional uh, about how we open up the economy since there's still not a treatment, uh, there's not a vaccine. Uh, to be honest, nothing really has changed other than the economy has taken a hit and folks have been spending time at home. But if we return back to the way things were before, uh, if we think that the death toll in group senior facilities are high today, um, we, I think, can't even imagine how worse they are gonna get if we don't proceed with caution. Uh, and I am, I am, Sad is not the right word, uh, but uh, just heartbroken with the number of cases we're seeing statewide and across the country in senior group facilities, uh, rest homes, nursing homes, uh, folks who still had many, many years ahead of them in life, uh, who had hopes and dreams, uh, who contracted COVID, went to bed one night and simply didn't wake up the next morning. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll admit, as a state, we, we weren't prepared early enough uh, to, to mitigate that spread. 
Uh, but one of the other things that I'm, I'm starting to unfortunately have to combat is the dismissal of these people's deaths as just a, a necessary byproduct of, of COVID-19 and the need for a successful economy. Uh, a constituent reached out the other day and her, her mom had recently passed away due to COVID-19. Uh, and to hear her share stories of people's dismissal of her mother's death uh, as just, you know, she was, she was old, you know, these things happen uh, when you know, a human person is trying to mourn in these unusual times only to have their loved one's uh, purpose in life dismissed as uh as a casualty a casualty of, of war is, yeah. is what uh, we're being what we're being told so i i share that jack i think it's 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 just uh they're just a, um, a horrendous way to 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 be to be looking at this um you know but i think to go to your your points and then i want to turn it over to arthur for some questions as well i don't want to dominate the conversation but you know it the reopening uh of our both our economy and our community life is, uh, is uh, I think, a, really kind of ramping up in terms of people want to get out in the world again, want to want to be out interacting with their family and friends. But I, you know, I, I, I personally need to stress, and I'm sure you will agree, the importance of doing this in a measured, phased approach based on data information and science uh despite the fact that you know we the, the the sun is out it's you know 70 degrees and you know we want to get out and live our lives so you know i think it's just important that we stress the need to kind of maintain the uh whether we, we agree with it or not at this point maintain that uh that phased and measured approach to this I think that's 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 a that's a, a great summary, and I I know at the beginning of the at the uh, of your 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 the show, Representative, you were saying, well, you know, you're not a med you know, you're not a doctor and you're not a medical professional, but it's like that's not your job. You know, your job is to be a leader, and I think what what so many of us, you know, I'm talking as a con as a constituent of a lot of people, what so many of us are so happy about is that the leaders are leading here. You know, we, we, we have to watch some, some of the stuff federally, we watch some in other states where it's like leaders are bickering, they're not leading. And it, it's just, it's so gratifying. But, but, but you know, and, and Steve, I appreciate you, you know, your, let me talk, let me ask a couple of questions because these are people, these are concerns of, of a lot of constituents. I've, I've lost four, I've lost four people, four clients to COVID in the last month. Uh, I've got several others. I thought I, I, we were going to lose a person yesterday, but he actually came, came back. But this is a big deal. And of, of those total five people, four of them had been in uh, um, nursing homes, although I know I've got a 99-year-old person in an assisted living who has now been locked down for a month and hasn't been able to leave her unit, right, and is worried that she'll never be able to walk again because she has no room, you know. So, so I guess I, 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 I say that by way of kind of asking the broader question. I'm sure that, that you and a lot of your, a lot of your cohorts um, are now also trying to think out as this continues, how does that change the way in which you regulate nursing homes and you regulate assisted livings? And I'm sure you've been thinking about that. I just, you know, I'm not looking for a, a solutions to this. I'm interested in a, from a thoughtful person like yourself, who's been obviously facing a lot of these issues and saying to yourself, how do we deal with that? You know, how do we deal with that in the future? It's certainly of concern. You know, every, everybody who's 70 has a pre-existing condition and that means and it's that they're 70, you know, and I turned 70 about four months ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of this, right? But what, what are you, what are your thoughts and what are you hearing about that? So I think part of the tension is between, uh, what's considered personal freedoms and then sort of public health necessity. Uh, and part of the trouble we're running into is that the state had implied that the, all of the employees at uh, these facilities were being tested. Uh, that's the headline. All, 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 all uh, employees of the prisons, of 
of nursing homes, of rest homes, they're being tested. Uh, they're being required to wear uh, masks and, and, and gowns. Uh, they're, they're being told they can't come into work if they're showing symptoms. Uh, but in reality, uh, I just was on a call this morning uh, where hearing from colleagues around the state, that's not the reality because individuals are refusing to be tested. They're refusing to wear PPEs as required. And the state is either unable or unwilling to uh, risk a lawsuit. Uh, and so what we're finding is it doesn't take more than one person to refuse to follow the guidelines to inadvertently be the, the vector uh, for the spread, be it in a supermarket uh, or, in, uh, or in a facility like this. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a larger conversation about uh, American culture uh, versus cultures around the planet. Uh, I'm very fortunate and very grateful to have friends uh, and colleagues in other countries. And we have been in nearly constant communication, uh, Spain and China in particular. Uh, the United States and Spain and China have three different kinds of government, three different, uh, very different cultures and ethos. Uh, but it has been very interesting to see their national response to this pandemic. Uh, China in particular, kids are going back to school. Universities are starting to open. Uh, I was on a, a call late last night with uh, Chinese business leaders uh, that I helped put together in which they mentioned that 70 to 80 percent of, uh, I think it's employees or no, it was employers are now open for business in the same way they were pre-COVID-19. The caveat is uh, there's a culture already of wearing a mask when you're not feeling well, not to protect oneself, uh, but to protect other people. Uh, and China has, of course, different laws uh, and, and um, not, a, not a US Bill of Rights, uh, but the ability to require students and require individuals to wear face coverings has meant uh, that they've been able to open. Uh, Spain and France, uh, in conversations with colleagues there, when they did a lockdown, it was a complete and enforced lockdown. If you wanted to go to the pharmacy, you literally had to go online, type up a form of where you were going, your address, carry that form with you. Uh, people will say that's not American, it'll never fly here, possibly true, but because we didn't actually do a full lockdown, um, I I'm trying to think of a nicer way to put it, but uh, an enforced, uh, requirement of social distancing two months ago, um, all it took was this play date here and this group of kids playing basketball here um, and this uh, romantic rendezvous here, uh, the police were unwilling or unable to enforce it. And so our lockdown, in my opinion, inconvenienced a great number of people, but all it took was a minority of folks to undermine that lockdown. And now, as we're talking about reopening, which is something that I think eventually needs to, to begin and needs to happen, uh, if we don't have the ability to uh, enforce face coverings, uh, if we don't have the ability to enforce social distancing, then how aren't we just gonna lose more and more people in residential facilities? And the fact that prison guards and um, employees of residential facilities have the right to refuse testing and can continue working. Uh, I, it's that tension between, again, their individual right to refuse and our collective responsibility to keep the most vulnerable healthy. Uh, and I wish it were a, uh, I wish we had the time to have the, the debate, you know, it's a good poli-sci uh, college debate. Uh, at a theoretical level, uh, but I think at the t at this time that debate is happening while more and more lives are being lost. Yeah, I, I, I really it's appreciate that. It's an interesting Thanks. conversation, Jack. I think uh, it is. It's, we can spend another show just on on how uh, America is very different than than other world situations. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, we we are. Uh, you know, part of it 
also goes directly to the what I see without getting into specifics, but the lack of leadership at the highest levels of our government and the mixed messages that are sent from that level. So that being said, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, but uh, Arthur, you have any any more uh, questions for Jack? No, I was I was just going to say I think that was a really I really appreciate that response. I think it's really a thoughtful response because I think it, it goes to what a lot of us are now trying to wrestle with just as as Americans of how you know how to balance this stuff out. But I I do get the sense you know go, going back to you, Steve, that from some of the folks that you've had on, that one of the things the kind of one of the things that this demonstrates is that if you have a real cohesiveness at the local level, you can deal with a lot of this stuff. Because it sounds like, from from what from what Steve and what the, what many of our guests have talked about, is that at the local level things have been pretty tight. You know, folks have been pretty good about this stuff. You know, and have been very very willing to participate and to and to connect with people. And 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 it, it's like a million little a million communities put together, maybe helps this work. But 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 it's really really hard. I I had I was not appreciating until you just explained it, that concern, for example, in the prisons, and certainly among, you know, the, the folks, the, 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 the employees of nursing homes, the, the notion of having the ability to, 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 to refuse testing, even, right, or, and, and to refuse, wear, you know, to, you know, the notion of not being, not being forced to wear a mask, those are really, that's tough, right, to try to, that. so that's something, as you said, that going forward, we've got to figure this out, because this, this, I guess the, to me, one, one of the things my, my wife regularly impresses on me is the fact is this, the, you know, this is, everybody knew this was coming. Not everybody, you know, a lot of players knew that sooner or later this was coming and that therefore something like it is going to come again. And so we need to get this figured out. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the thoughtfulness, you know. You know, I, I, I keep trying to think of, of parallels. Uh, I think we're so accustomed as as individuals and in the spirit of American individualism, that we have the ability to make choices, uh, to, to define our own future, to set our own path, that if it's cold outside, we have the, the personal choice to either dress warmly or be cold. Uh, we have the personal choice. But in this case, you know, kind of like driving, we can make the choice to drive the speed limit, uh, to uh, to wear your seatbelt, uh, to uh, not drink and then drive. So we can make a lot of personal choices to keep ourselves safe. And then there's just this hope that other people are going to do the same. But our personal responsibility is mostly to ourself. In this case, what we're asking people to do, yeah, wash their hands. Uh, but the wearing of the mask doesn't really help the wearer. It helps everyone else. And so it's this weird ask where... Uh, we're asking everyone to do something that isn't being required of everyone else. Uh, doing something that's it's annoying, it's it's hot, uh, it, it's getting it's weird to you know you're talking to someone through a mask. It's it's counter to American culture in so many ways, uh, and I think that's part of the part of the tension we're having is asking people to do things not for themselves uh, but for other people and people who who aren't their family members. Uh, who aren't necessarily their loved ones, uh, but who are the, the the grocery store employees that they don't even know the name of. Uh, I, don't know, I think most people are trying to do what's best uh, and are trying to unfortunately read between the lines of if the World Health Organization says one thing and uh, the president says another thing and the China's government says a third thing and their state rep is saying a fourth thing, who do you believe? Uh, and I think the, the face covering, unfortunately, is a perfect example where uh, early on out of China, they said people are asymptomatic, everyone needs to wear a mask. Uh, I think it was the CDC that said, no, not necessary. The president continued that narrative. I continued to go about my life not wearing any face covering. And then overnight, a new uh, bulletin goes out, I think from the CDC, saying, oh, sorry, we were wrong. You've got to wear a mask. Uh, and even that, what is it? What is six feet when you're running? Uh, what is six feet when you're riding a bike? Uh, there, there's too much minutiae minutia to, to explain to people in one sentence. 
uh, which I think is also part of the problem. Sure. Uh, people so don't know. Me, yeah. Let me so, just jump in here for a second, just because I know we're, we're starting to run out of time, but I wanted to circle back to what Art had just talked about in terms of you know, services at the local level and what's going on in Ashland. Like, you know, uh, it's, you know, we have a COVID-19 task force. Uh, it's headed by a, a Ed Berman, a police sergeant uh, here in Ashland. Uh, we've got a very active uh, food pantry process. We have uh, an Ashland emergency fund that's been a beneficiary of a lot of donations throughout the community. And is providing services to a, a lot of folks. We're starting to look into a, uh, a rental relief program as well uh, that we can institute uh, hopefully sometime soon. Um, so, you know, it's to, I guess it's think globally and act locally is, is the message here. And, uh, and, and, and Steve, I can't, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your being able to get your state rep to come back and talk to us because I think this, you know, you know, real we, getting a sense of kind of what's going on at that level, right? With, and 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 also just getting a sense, it makes you feel good about the thoughtfulness of your leadership. You know, I think that's and and, and it, uh, people are willing to do a lot of stuff as long as they really trust, right? As long as they trust the government. So I, I I really appreciate it. So Steve, thank you, thank you once again for just yep. for doing this, Representative. Thank thank you so much. We really so, appreciate it. We look forward right. to seeing you live at some point. Yeah, Art, I just want to follow up one more yeah. thing before we yeah. sign off, and that's to, to speak about, uh, you know, maintaining the, the process of democracy, which I th Jack spoke to uh, earlier and is just so, uh, so, so critical to our, to our way of life, our way of thinking, and uh, just want to let our viewers know we have a town election on, on June the 24th. Uh, we're in the process of making preparations for both having a polling place set up in a, in a socially distant and healthy manner, as well as the ability to either absentee or, or early vote as well. So those, that information will be forthcoming, but encourage everybody to, you know, to, to, to vote and to uh, participate and continue to participate in our democracy. That's, that's, and that's a great point. And maybe we should have maybe, you know, the town clerk or somebody to come on and just talk about how that's all going to work. Right. I know that's a whole other challenge. That is. So, so Jack, thank you very much as always, uh, always a pleasure. And, uh, you know, thank you for your, your thoughtfulness and, 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 and all the work that you're doing. And I just so, wanted to, and thank you so much. You. I just wanted to remind folks that if there is anything even remotely connected to a state service that you're having issues with, uh, even if you think it might not be a state issue, uh, if it's a federal issue or a local issue, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we are getting hundreds of emails asking for help on unemployment benefits. If you reached out to our office, we try to get back with you within an hour. I often give folks my cell number and say, text me if we don't get back with you within 24 hours. Uh, but do follow up with us again. We're getting people reaching out, emails best, you know, followed by phone but we're getting Facebook messages and tweets and people are reaching out in new and modern ways. Uh, we just want to make sure no one's falling through the cracks. Uh, and, for, and for our seniors who may not be as so terrifically tech savvy, can you give us a phone number? Since Great. I don't remember my office number, let me just give you my cell and you can, you can put that yeah. on the bottom. 508-479-5555. Uh, and if, if texting is, is something uh, you're comfortable with, uh, sometimes a, a quick text is best. Uh, but if folks have a lot of information, feel free to call. Uh, but again, sending it via email, uh, that way we can forward it along. Uh, I can't make any promises if it's a local question or a federal one, but we will forward it along. I know at the local level, people are getting back to folks very quickly as well. Uh, Catherine Clark's office, our Congresswoman, uh, has also been helping. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces and just I appreciate in advance everyone's patience uh, but we're here to help in any way we can uh, and just don't hesitate to reach out even if you've never reached out to an elected official before uh, even if you and I might not agree on anything politically in your opinions uh, we're here just to help uh, and happy to have any conversation 
uh, at any point. Steve, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Ashland, the COVID-19 edition. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you.